Today we begin a new series of studies on Joseph, as of Joseph and the Multicoloured Dreamcoat. We've entitled the series, God Meant It for Good. After that phrase in the last book of Genesis, where Joseph says to his brothers, don't be afraid, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, for accomplishing which is now being done, the saving of many lives. We're going to read from Genesis chapter 37, the story of Joseph. Beginning at verse 1 then. Jacob, that is Joseph's father, lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the son of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and couldn't speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said to them. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing their flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off to the valley of Hebron, from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering in the fields and asking, asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? They've moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say a ferocious animal devoured him. And we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh. And they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern, 
and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? They got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. And we thank God for his word that we have read together. We're going to be thinking about Joseph in just a minute. A story of uh, a young man who, by the end of the chapter that we've already read, found himself being taken to be sold as a slave in Egypt. Well, the question that I want to ask about this is, whose fault was it? Who do we blame for what happened to Joseph? Let's pray together. Father, as we think about this part of Scripture and the many deeply unpleasant things that it records for us, enable us by your Spirit to see that which isn't easy to see and to hear that voice that sometimes gets lost in all the noise around us so that we might know you better and follow you more closely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, well, who was to blame then? I want to suggest a number of answers. I'm guessing that uh, there's probably one answer coming to your mind straight away. There's another one filtering in, perhaps maybe a third. I'm going to suggest at least four answers to the question of who was to blame for what happened to, to Joseph. Can I ask another question? Has anybody ever been in a Joseph-like situation? You've been a part of a group and everything has gone wrong. Maybe it's part of a family that might be described as dysfunctional. Or maybe it's uh, that you work in in a workplace and things are just bad. You just don't like going into work really these days at all. In fact, you're quite glad that you're not going into work these days. Or maybe it's your friendship group. And, yeah, there's just something. You always seem to be the butt of the jokes or the one who's left out. Well, when we look at Joseph, we see some things that maybe help us to, to get through situations like that. You'll see I've got, I've got here my uh, rather low-tech version of what I try to do uh, any time I preach. I'd, I'd like to use images. Now, I'm not going to draw. I'm just going to put up a few words. So, is the group that you're thinking about that applies to yourself? Family? Friends? work. Now, of course, those aren't the only three, but they're the most common groups that we're part of. Okay, let's go back into Joseph then. So, who's to blame for what happened to Joseph? I think the first hint that we get of of who's to blame for, for Joseph is in some of the things that we find before chapter 37, in chapter 37, and after. And this is the one that I guess most folk wouldn't have thought of. Let me put it up. Do 
It's the culture that they were part of. Joseph's family had grown up within a particular culture at that time. Obviously, we all grew up within a certain culture. But if you go back to chapter 34, you'll find an ugly story of uh, one of Jacob's daughters who was raped. Her rapist seems to have fallen in love with her. But her two brothers decide to wreak revenge, and not only do they kill the rapist, but they kill his whole family as well. So the culture was a time of anarchy. Government was really not good. If you come to the end of uh, the chapter that we looked at, in verse 36, where does Joseph go? Joseph is sold into slavery. Now, this is part of the culture, but it's worth mentioning. Here's a culture in which people could be bought and sold for their labor. Starting to sound familiar? They were only as good as what they could produce. Their only value was in what they could make. And so Joseph was sold as not even a hired hand, but a bought hand. So work wasn't in a good, a good place at that time in that culture. And then did you notice uh, in verse 2 that Joseph told a, a tale on a couple of uh, young men, a couple of his brothers, the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah, his father's wives. So family life wasn't in a great state at this time either. Jacob was married to at least four women that, that we know of. It's possibly more, but certainly four. So family life in that culture wasn't good. So you've got government's not good, work's not good, and family life isn't good. Hmm. Worth thinking about, isn't it? When I start to put my life in context and ask who's to blame, we are part of a broader culture. And what's going on in that culture eventually brings itself down into my life and has its effect. Okay, so that's the first person who's to blame or the first thing that's to blame. Who else is to blame for what happened to Joseph? Well, let me write it up. His da. Jacob was to blame. I don't think there's any, any doubt about that. What do we know of Jacob that may have made him culpable at this point? Well, we know something about his character called the deceiver. We know that from his earliest days, he was a schemer. This is just, just what he was. And if you go back to chapter 27, you'll read the famous story about Jacob fooling his father and stealing his older brother Esau's birthright. An ugly story, an unpleasant story of deception. So his character wasn't great. But if you read through Jacob's life between then and this point, you'll see a number of things happened. So what he went through in his life formed him as, as well. Think of, of uh, how he became married to Rachel and to Leah. He fell in love with Rachel. He wanted to marry her. He got his father, her father's agreement. And then her father tricked him. And after uh, Jacob was married, he went on working for his father-in-law, and his father kept on tricking him. And eventually, Jacob responded by tricking his father-in-law. So there was a pattern building up here. His character his experience weren't going to make him a great father. And then, if we bring it right up to date in terms of the story, there was how he treated his family, how he carried out his fathering, if you like. We read that he simply favored Joseph. He had ten other sons, but this was his favorite. Joseph was the... Uh, you know the phrase? He was the wee late one. He was always going to be the apple of his father's eye. He was born in his old age. He was born to the woman that he loved more than all of the others, to, to Rachel. So it's not surprising that he favored Joseph. And you can see straight away, can't you, that as he was doing this, he was setting things up for everything to go wrong. And it did. And it's like that in many groups, in families. It can be like that with parents. 
who through their experience, through their character, through all that they are, just don't order their families in the way that they ought to. Or in work, if your boss is not good, if your boss has his or her problems, well then that can work out very badly for the folk who are there. And every group of friends has an informal leader, don't they? There's just that one person who seems to be the one who everybody looks to. And if they're not a good person, then things aren't going to go well in the group. So, if things are going wrong for me, what's my culture doing? What's happening with the leadership of the group that I'm part of, whether it's formal or informal? And then the third, peop- third group of people who were responsible, and you've seen this coming, haven't you? I could have put BR in front of those uh, letters there, couldn't I, the brothers? But let me just leave them as it is. And again, you're probably guessing why. It's the other members of the group. Well, I like to be a nice guy. I do. I mean, I like to see the, the, the better side of people. And so when I look at Joseph's brothers and I ask, well, you know, is there an excuse for them? And we've already begun to see that there is a bit of an excuse Their father didn't treat them well. Joseph was the one who was loved. They were the ones who felt ignored, felt left out. And of course, even in a perfect family, there's always a certain amount of competition, isn't there, between siblings, competition for their their parents' affection. And normally it's friendly, and normally it's, it's okay, but sometimes it can get out of hand, just as it did here. Workplaces are competitive places often, aren't they? Friendship groups are competitive. But we try to navigate that, and that's, that's fine. But of course, the other part of the truth about his brothers is that they were not good guys. They just weren't. Again, a couple of examples. Back in chapter 34, I've already mentioned uh, the rape of, of Dinah and the two brothers, Simeon and Levi, extracting their revenge, but just going way over the top. Or in chapter 35, verse 22, we have Reuben, who has an affair with with his stepmother. In chapter 38, we have Judah, who has sex with his daughter-in-law. Oh, well, his excuse was he thought she was a prostitute. (laughs) Where are we going with that? And of course, there's the events of this chapter, chapter 37. These are not good guys. So if something's going wrong, and you're feeling that very intensely, this could be the third reason. Because the people who are part of one of these groups or other are sinful, fallen human beings, as we all are. As we all are. But perhaps their input into what's going on just needs to be addressed. And then, another one to to add to this list. Who is to blame? Yeah. Imagine I'm Joseph writing this, okay? Okay. Joseph. Well, what do you say about Joseph? Opinions divide on Joseph... Their older commentators tend to say Joseph was a godly young man who was deeply misunderstood. The newer commentators tend to say that, um, do any of you know this phrase? It's a phrase that my mother used to use and my grandmother, I remember it from childhood. See the one one? Couldn't like him if you'd reared him. And I get the feeling that that was, was Joseph actually. He wasn't the nicest guy. And and there are a number of aspects to that. The first reason why he wasn't nice... (laughs) Hold on. The first reason why he wasn't nice is because he was 17. Simple as that. Just stop there. He was 17. And we're told that at the start of the chapter. Now, before all the 17-year-olds, well, let me make it teenagers. He was a teenager. Um, Yeah... There's something about teenagers, isn't there? There really is. Um, But that's okay. 
I don't want you to misunderstand me. Teenagers are going through a transition in life. They're moving from childhood to adulthood. And it's a difficult transition. And in contemporary culture, it's actually quite a long transition. It can be between about the ages of 10 and 25, 26. Teenagers, life isn't straightforward. And Joseph was a teenager. Second, he was spoiled rotten. You've got the coat as part of the evidence for that. But you've also got the fact that uh, twice we're told in this chapter that he was around about the house while everyone was out. Just before Jacob sends him to find his uh, brothers, we're told he was around the house. Now, when Jacob said, go and find your brothers and see if they're okay. I mean, Joseph wasn't saying, look, I've got these horses to shoe or I've got these things to do. I'm really busy. Joseph was just around the house. So he was a teenager. He was spoiled rotten. Verse 2, he was a telltale. Now, we don't know anything more than he saw his, his brothers doing something wrong, and he told his father. Well, that's not going to make him popular at all, is it? He had no insight into people either, did he? Now, I mean, put yourself in his position, the the dreamer. So Joseph has a dream, and he tells the dream to his brothers. That is, in effect, saying, you're going to bow down to me. Needless to say, his brothers aren't best pleased. And then there's another dream that says the same thing and brings his father and mother in. Now, if he has any sense at all, he's going to just keep his big mouth shut for a while. But, oh, no, I've had this dream, and you're all going to bow down to me, and so are mom and dad. Well, it's no surprise that uh, his brothers don't take well to him. He just didn't have that sense of, of people. He didn't know when to speak and when to keep quiet. And he just comes across as arrogant, doesn't he? He comes across as someone who just knows better. I love that that quotation that's sometimes attributed to uh, Mark Twain in various forms. Um, When I was 17, I was amazed at how little my father knew. When I became 21, I was amazed at how much he had learned in four years. Joseph was still at that stage where he thought he knew everything. So who was to blame? I think we have to say that part of the reason was Joseph himself. And you can see now why I've put up those two letters. If I'm in this situation where everything's going wrong for me and things are not good in one of these three groups or whichever group we're thinking about, it could be part of the culture that's having an effect. It could be the one who's leading the group who has the effect. It could be the others in the group. Or, yep, it could be me. Worth thinking about. Okay, let me start to draw this to to a finish. Whose story is it? Whose story have we been looking at? Yes, it's Joseph's story, but you can see by what I've written there that it's also somebody else's story. Now, I suppose I could have taken the word Jacob out here and put the word leader or group leader or something like that in there, and that would have made the picture complete. But Joseph's story and our stories tend to be quite similar. And in particular, If what you're going through at the minute is difficult, we know know all the difficulties that are associated with our current circumstances. We know all of those. And actually, it may be that those are flagging up things that have lain hidden for a while. Could be family tensions. Could be in your group of friends where you're stunned that nobody actually has been in touch with you. Or they've been barbed in a way that I hadn't noticed before. Or the pressures of work are starting to look different as people are jockeying for position in new ways that, well, 
So it's the story of Joseph. But the story of Joseph is wrapped up in a bigger story. My story is wrapped up in a bigger story. Yes, it's the story of my family, my friends, my workmates, of the culture, but it's also the story, Joseph's story, my story, the story, whoops, of living in a fallen world. The fact is we live in a world that is not perfect. We live in a world that is tainted, that is disrupted by sin. We live in a world where everything is corrupted, where everyone is corrupted, and where I rather like that word that was in the um, first of the questions that we had earlier on. As a consequence of the fall, we are in a state of misery. We are miserable. The fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. And so my story, Joseph's story, is part of that story of dysfunctional families, of disrupted friendships, of improper work patterns, of broken cultures, all of that story. But even that isn't the final story, because that's part of a bigger story as well. And that bigger story peeps through in what we've read in chapter 37. And I wonder, did you notice... Let me just th run through nine little places where you see that bigger story starting to peep through. You see it in verses 5 to 10 twice when Joseph has dreams. And we could focus on those at length, but those are for another day. Those will play out in the future. What's going on? This isn't entirely natural, is it? There's something funny happening here when Joseph has dreams. In verse 11, when Jacob is told of Joseph's dreams... What do we read? Jacob kept these things to himself. He saw something. I wonder, was Jacob making a connection in his life and Joseph's experience with what he himself had experienced all those years ago at Bethel? In that dream, was he? Possibly so, but something's going on. In verse 15, we get to Shechem. The brothers have gone, and there just happens to be a bloke there who knew where they had gone to. What are the chances of that? Something's going on here. They plan to kill him, but Reuben has a soft heart. He's not the same as all the rest. There's something going on behind the scenes here. And then when he's in the pit... There just happened to be a group of Ishmaelites come along. And they just happened to fancy buying a slave to make an extra few bob on in Egypt. Just happens. Judah has his scheme. Let's not kill him. Let's get our money back. Well, was he being more evil than the rest or was he being not so evil? It doesn't really matter. But here was the death plan put aside. What's going on there? There's something bubbling up, isn't there? Verse 29, we have Reuben's soft heart again. What's going on? And at the very end, who's Joseph sold to? A rich merchant who's going to just work him on his ship sailing through the Mediterranean. A rich farmer who's going to work him to death because he's just another pair of hands. No, he's sold to Potiphar, a senior official in the Egyptian government who has the ear of Pharaoh. What's going on? Something is peeping through here. Another story is being told. And that's God's great story. Joseph's story is part of the story of fallen humanity, but it's also the story of God's salvation. And so is your story and mine. We're part of that. As God created the world, as God has redeemed the world in Christ Jesus, and as God will bring all things to fruition at the end, we move between these two stories, the story of God's great redemption and the story of fallen humanity, and we have choices to make. And we might make choices one way or the other. We can decide, am I going to just buy into the fallenness of the world? Am I going to make that my story? That's the story of misery, by the way. 
Or am I going to make God's great story my story? Am I going to buy into that? Am I going to live that? Am I going to follow that? Because that's the story of fulfillment and peace, salvation, and eternal life. So as we navigate our story, and as we understand the story of other people with whom we interact, how are we going to do that? How? Let's choose what story we're going to be part of, we're going to buy into. Shall we? I'm going to lead you in a short prayer now. And after that prayer, we're going to have our prayers of intercession. And they're going to be led by the Roberts family. Let me lead you first. Gracious God, you are the one who convinces us that we are sinful and in misery. But to be honest, Lord, some of us don't really need much convincing because we're aware of it. You're the one who points to us and says, you need a savior. And some of us are becoming more and more aware of that. But you're the one who enlightens our minds to the knowledge of Christ. You're the one who renews our wills. You're the one who persuades us and enables us to receive Christ Jesus freely offered to us in the gospel. And you're the one who empowers us to live your story even in the midst of a fallen and corrupt world. You are the one who brings to effect your gifts in our life. You are the one who makes us more like Jesus. You are the one who makes us right before your heavenly Father. You are the one who has adopted us into your family. You are the one who is making us more and more like Jesus day by day. And you are bringing to us all the good things that you have to give us as your family. So gracious God, enable us day by day, moment by moment, more and more to embrace you, to live your story for your glory, for the benefit of your world and your people. And to know in doing that, your peace. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that through Christ we can once again draw near to your throne of grace with confidence. Almighty God, we lift up to you all our concerns about the coronavirus currently sweeping through our world. Help us in all our present worries to remember that you are a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Father, we pray that you would protect those who are most vulnerable to the virus. We lift up those who are older and frailer, those with pre-existing health conditions, and those without access to good medical care. We pray they would know your peace and protection. Lord, in our country and abroad, would you bring calmness to those who are fretful, healing to those already sick, and comfort to the bereaved families. We also remember those who feel lonely and isolated. Lord, in your mercy, would you stop the spread of the virus? We lift up to you in particular communities struggling to contain the infection, like in Ecuador, in Latin America. We pray that effective medical treatments to combat the virus can be found quickly. Lord, would you aid our scientists with knowledge and insights and help them to join forces across national boundaries as they work on developing a safe and effective vaccine? Lord, we also pray for our governments, that you would enable them to make wise decisions as they try to steer us out of lockdown. We lift up our Prime Minister Boris Johnston to you in prayer, asking for you to return him quickly to work at number 10 again. Please also protect the health of our, all our political leaders in London, Dublin and Stormont, and guard them and their families from hurtful abuses on social media in these strenuous times. Heavenly Father, safeguard our civil servants and chief medical officers, 
give them rest after long days at work. Also grant them, we ask, concentration, attentiveness to detail and energy to communicate effectively to the media. We pray for our frontline workers, those working in community care settings, care homes, our hospitals and the key workers in emergency and support services. Thank you for all these workers, some risking their own health to keep us safe, many overwhelmed and exhausted by the demands placed upon them. Lord, give them encouragement, energy and wisdom. Protect them with the right equipment and give them enough rest between shifts. Please provide health and strength to volunteers working with the various food banks during this crisis. Lord God, we pray for our pastoral care team here in Bloomfield Presbyterian Church. Please guide Frank, Sam, Michael and Elizabeth and our elders as they adapt to new technology and rely on phone calls to reach out to people in need. Fill us as your followers in Bloomfield Presbyterian Church with your Holy Spirit. Help us to know how to best serve our communities during this time of lockdown and bring the good news of salvation in Jesus to the doorsteps of our neighbourhood. We pray for Helen Lou and pray she can continue to share the good news about Jesus in Japan as Japan goes back to a state of emergency. Please protect Helen, her friends and other missionaries in Japan. As many countries around the world are enforcing quarantine on their populations, we read of new alarming concerns about the risk of a possible hunger pandemic around the world. Father God, we are thinking of people most at risk of famine in countries ravaged by recent conflicts, such as Yemen, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Venezuela and South Sudan. We pray that you will provide food security to people in these countries and bring continued sustainable relief for the suffering through the vital work of aid agencies and NGOs. We lift up the persecuted church in China in our prayers. We pray that the whole of China will have the opportunity to respond to the gospel. Show your love to the young people in China even though they can't go to church and help Christians who are being watched by the government. We pray for parents of children who have complex needs here in Northern Ireland. Lord, grant strength and patience to parents of children with special needs during the lockdown. Please help them to access the necessary support services that are available. Please also safeguard the vulnerable women in our society from domestic abuse during the lockdown. May they know that your steadfast love never ceases and your mercies never end. They are new every morning. Help them to put their hope and trust in you. Equip us as a body of Christ to respond to their needs also. Help us to be still and know that you are God. Amidst all the uncertainties, we rejoice that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Lord, in your mercy, answer our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 